It is not infrequent to find a child with burns, especially hot liquid burns, that is scals, in pediatric practice. Pediatrics is primarily an emergency medicine branch because even stable children can land into acute situations anytime. And hence the IAP has come up with its national treatment guidelines on the management of burns and scals in childhood. This is the patient I have recently managed of burns. And I urge to you to watch the video till the end as at places I have contrasted these guidelines with the Nelson's textbook to make a comprehensive package for you. But prior to that, if you are a person who wants to stay updated with the latest in pediatrics, have crystal clear concepts, you don't have time to go through the entire guidelines and just need a succinct, succinct summary, you are just better with illustrations rather than simply reading the text and you want a rapid and a reliable reckoner, then I guess this is the channel for you. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I urge you to subscribe to the channel because here you will stay abreast of latest guidelines and recommendations in pediatrics, clear your concepts in basic and advanced pediatrics, and also learn the demonstration of clinical examination skills. Burns and scalps are acute injuries to the skin and the underlying tissues which can be caused by heat, by friction, electrical discharges, chemicals, or radiation. If we see the epidemiology, then around global health problem, it is a global health problem accounting for 1.8 lakh deaths annually, as mentioned in the NTG. 10 lakh people are affected every year in India, and childhood burns contribute significantly to the number. Fifth most common cause of non-fatal childhood injuries, most burns in children, especially less than 5 years, happen in kitchen due to spillage of hot liquids. And global burn registry data reveals that more than 50% of children sustain major burns that is more than equal to 15% of the total body surface area. So major burns is something which is more than 15, more than equal to 15% of the total body surface area of the child. One must also remember that the Nelson textbooks of textbook of pediatrics mentions that in less than five years scals are the most common type of burn injuries but in more than five years that is between five to 14 years of age group that is the pediatric age group flame injuries are the most common type of burn injuries burns have been classified on two bases first is on the basis of depth and second is on the basis of the extent of the body surface area involved so on the basis of depth the iap has classified burns as superficial burns which appear dry red and they blanch they are painful healing occurs in around three to six days superficial partial thickness burns which have blisters they are red they blanch they are painful and they heal in around seven to twenty one days the deep partial thickness burns are pink to white in color they blanch slowly they are less painful because the nerve endings quite number of nerve endings have been destroyed Healing takes place in more than 21 days and they usually require surgery. Full thickness burns are waxy white to charred and black. They have no blanching. They are not painful to touch because of damage to all the nerve roots. They do not heal without surgical treatment. The Nelson's textbook of pediatrics has instead used the terms as first degree, second degree superficial and deep and third degree type of burns. Also. The technological assessment of the depth of burns as per the Nelson's textbook can be done by two methods. First is the laser Doppler imaging and second is by the reflectance confocal microscopy and optical coherence tomography. There are three, ty three types of thermal burns. Those which come in contact with hot liquids are referred to as scales. Those which occur due to contact with hot solid objects are referred to as contact burns and third are burns from fire which are referred to as the flame burns if we see the pathophysiology burns lead to an increased capillary permeability which in turn leads to interstitial and fluid protein leak this in turn leads to disruption of collagen and hyaluronic acid scaffolding or lining which leads to progressive protein and fluid loss and this ultimately leads to hypoperfusion, which if compounded by SIRS, which is compounded by SIRS and myocardial dysfunction. So all this occurs in burns. 
Initial management is the same as that for other diseases, airway, breathing, circulation, disability management and exposure of the patient. But one must remember that one must not be distracted by the dramatic nature of the burns. Rather, treat any child of burns as same as the child of trauma. Correct issues with A, B, C, D, E first and start with cervical spine immobilization as in patients with polytrauma. For airway, we look for strider, hoarse voice, singed facial, nasal hair, suit or mouth or nose. And our concern is airway obstruction from edema and respiratory collapse. So, we may require early intubation of the patient, keeping in mind that we may face difficulty in intubation. So, an expert should preferably do it. Succinylcholine can be used up till 48 hours after, after burns. In breathing, we assess for whether the history of burns is that in a closed space, if there is respiratory distress, hypoxemia, and if there is chest wall and abdominal wall burns, especially circumferential. Because our concern is about the carbon monoxide and cyanide poisoning, for in which case we need to give 100% oxygen, hydrocobox hydroxocobalamin 70 mg per kg for cyanide poisoning smoke inhalational injury is another concern in which case we may need to give nebulization and ventilatory support and early escarotomy is recommended if there are burns in this area in circulation we must look for whether or not there is shock or profound hypovolemia actually this is not a normal initial response to burn so we must look for shock and blood loss and cardiac dysfunction especially in patients with cyanide poisoning and pneumothorax and circumferential limb burns we must be readily transfuse we must readily transfuse blood products provide surgical consultation and go for early escarotomy if required for disability we must look for hypoxemia shock and head spine injuries Consider carbon monoxide or cyanide poisoning and treat the underlying cause. For exposure, we must look for temperature and other traumatic injuries elsewhere in the body. Hypothermia is invisible to the naked eye unlike a burn injury. So, we must go for control of the room temperature to around 28 to 30 degrees, 32 degrees centigrade. Remove the burnt clothing and constricting jewelry and give warm IV fluids to the patient. One must consider child abuse if there is history of inconsistent or incompatible injury pattern. There is delay in seeking treatment for the child. There is a straight line of demarcation between normal and the burnt tissue. There is a glove and stocking distribution of burns. In which case, you may assume that the hands or the feet of the child were immersed in hot fluids. The child is unusually passive. He is not responding to your queries. And burns are of different ages, which means that the child would have been inflicted the injuries at different points of time. One must remove hot burnt clothing and provide copious irrigation with saline. Nelson's textbook additionally mentions that one must cover the burnt area with blanket or coat or carpet to cut off the oxygen supply immediately and so that it helps in extinguishing the burn. One must cover open burns with dry sterile dressings and do not break or aspirate intact blisters. Topical antibiotics like silver sulfadiazine and bacitracin can be used, but silver sulfadiazine should be avoided near eyes and mouth. One must consider early transfer to the burn center. If at all, burns are of third degree. They are partial thickness but more than 10%. Any burns involving the face, hands, feet, perineum and genitalia. Electrical burns, chemical burns and inhalational burns and concomitant trauma or underlying comorbidities. These are the indications given by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. In addition, Nelson mentions in patients who, have, who are suspected to be victims of child abuse or neglect and in patients with face and neck or enclosed space fire burns, one must admit the patient to observe for at least 24 hours. Starting with the management, fluids and hydration form the mainstay of burns management. What, when, how, we shall be discussing now. So the indications of fluid resuscitation include burn surface area of more than 15% total body surface area, 
partial thickness or blistered burns and full thickness burns in cases of less than 15 to 20% burnt area one must start with 150% maintenance fluids instead of the typical formula based resuscitation of burns as we will be seeing soon crystalloids are the first choice ringer lactate is used commonly and is the fluid recommended in nelsons isotonic crystalloids with 5% dextrose maintenance should be administered in infants and young children to keep them calorie replete so dextrose needs to be added to the fluid of infants and young children so to calculate the extent of the surface area of the body which has been burned we use formulas for older children more than 14 years of age and for adults we use the rule of nines but for children who are less than 14 years of age we use charts like lund and browder and shriner's hospital chart so this is lund and browder chart and this is the shriner's hospital chart initial fluid requirement is calculated by the parkland's formula which is 4 ml per kg per person body surface area burnt half of this has to be administered in first 8 hours from the time of burn now for example if the person if a patient has been burnt and he has presented to the hospital 2 hours later then the same amount of fluid that is half of this has to be administered in the remaining 6 hours because 2 hours have already lapsed before the patient came to the hospital the remaining half has to be administered over 16 hours but along with this maintenance fluids also have to be given other formulas for fluid resuscitation in burns patients are also there but these provide only a rough approximation of the actual requirements and careful tracking of the response needs to be done and urine output is a sensitive indicator so one must target an output of more than 1 ml per kg for young children and more than 0.5 ml per kg for older children and adults adolescents and urine output should be combined with monitoring of vital signs and decide on to increasing or decreasing the fluids rather a multimodal approach like arterial blood pressure and echocardiogram which is bedside available with the help of point of care ultrasound it also needs to be done to assess the adequacy of resuscitation especially in massive burns which is more than 40% of the body surface area involved required uh, involved increased fluid requirements are seen in patients with inhalational injury electrical injury delay in resuscitation and concomitant trauma and nelson's textbook additionally mentions that in the next 24 hours half of the first day requirement needs to be given in the form of rl and 5% dextrose large volume crystalloids lead to edema compartment syndrome airway edema and acute respiratory distress syndrome 5% albumin as a colloid can be considered after 8 to 12 hours in burns with more than 40% of the total body surface area involved or in patients with high crystalloid requirement as evidenced by iv index of more than 250 ml per kg in 24 hours so what is iv index iv index is basically the amount of fluid which is given in the first 24 hours after burns so if it exceeds more than 250 ml per kg it becomes an independent predictor of mortality in patients with burns also total or predicted total resuscitation volume of 6 ml per kg per total body surface area per person total body surface area of the burns if it is there then there is a high risk of mortality and albumin may be considered nelsons additionally mentions that ffp transfusion should be done only if prothrombin time is more than 4.5 times the control and aptt is more than 1.2 times the control if we look at the comprehensive burn management we also need to manage pain with iv fentanyl or morphine infusions or bolus additional analgesia including fentanyl and ketamine may be required for procedural pain nutritional rehabilitation is very important because burns cause a hypermetabolic response with protein and fat catabolism so one must provide early enteral feeds preferably within the first 24 hours if possible if the patient is hemodynamically stable and is uh, physiologically relatively normal 
calories at 150% of the basal metabolic rate with 3 to 4 gram per kg per day of protein are suggested for patients with burns, especially more than 40% total body surface area involved. Early excision in grafting, adequate pain control and temperature control reduce the hypermetabolic response. Immunization with tetanus vaccine is recommended for burns more than 10% that is for our hospitalized patients. Nelson mention, mentions that you can use either Tdap or DPT in a patient with more than 10% burns if according to the age. So that is Tdap in more than equal to 7 years of age and DPT in less than 7 years of age. No recommendation of routine antibiotics is mentioned as per the IAP though Nelson mentions penicillin antibiotics to be used. For infection prevention, surgical burn wound management is very important in improving outcomes and children with more than 30% burns need to be managed in isolation units to prevent cross infection and temperature control. So ideally there should be a burns unit in every surgical ward. Nelson's additionally mentions that forced alkaline diuresis can be used in patients with high tension electrical injuries to avoid myoglobinuric renal damage. So a rapid revision, most burns in children especially less than 5 years happen in kitchens due to spillage of hot liquids and they are known as CALS. Initial management comprises of removing the hot burnt clothing, obvious irrigation with saline, covering the open burns with dry sterile dressings using topical antibiotics like silver sulfadiazine and bacitracin. Indications for fluid resuscitation are more than 15% TBSA, blistered or partial thickness burns and full thickness burns. Remember these are different from indications for hospitalization which is burn surface area more than 10% and in which case you need to give 150% maintenance IV fluids. Parkland formula is used for the correction of the fluid resuscitation volume. Calculation of the fluid resuscitation volume, it is 4 ml per kg per total, person total body surface area burn, the half of which is administered in 8 hours from the time of burn and half over the next 8, 16 hours along with the maintenance fluids and the next 24 hours fluid is around 50% of the first day's requirement. Calculation of total body surface area burnt in older children more than 14 years and adults is done by using the rule of nines. In younger children, age appropriate charts like the Lyndon Browder chart or Shiner's hospital chart is to be used. Crystalloids are the first choice and preferably RL, dextrose based fluid for infants and young children. 5% albumin can be considered after 8 to 12 hours in burns with more than 40% total body surface area involved or with high crystalloid requirement. Manage pain, early nutrition, and no routine antibiotic coverage is recommended for burns. Tetanus immunization is recommended for more than 10% of the body surface area burns. And surgical wound management is as important as medical management. Thank you so much for a very patient listening and watching. And if you did find the video interesting, please give a thumbs up. And uh, thank you and thanks a lot.